Sounds great. Let me hide my bookmarks bar. There's nothing <laughs> that interesting there. Uh, okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for, for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here uh, to give this talk. The, in this talk, I'm gonna explain a little bit of what Dask is. I'm gonna explain why you might consider using Dask for machine learning workflows. Um, in the second half of the talk, I'll do a live demo. I'll show you some examples of using Dask and the LightGBM project. I'll explain a little bit about LightGBM. Um, and then at the end, we'll leave some time for question and answer. And actually, let me grab my phone so, to be sure that I don't lose track of time. And in the question and answer, I'd be happy to answer questions about this talk, about LightGBM in general, whatever, whatever you think I can be helpful with. So as Kevin mentioned, um, I am working as an engineer at a company called Saturn Cloud. At Saturn, we, are, we run a managed service for data scientists where basically we manage Dask for you, we manage Jupyter, and um, you know, just give you a workspace to do some work and not need to handle some of the other orchestration work around you know, getting your credentials out to your Dask cluster, cloning Git repos, doing, doing fun stuff like that. So. Um, I'll have my contact details up on the last slide if you'd like to talk about that, but we are not gonna talk about Saturn Cloud anymore for the rest of the talk. All right, so before we get into the how part of this, the tutorial part of this, I wanna talk about why you might even need something like Desk. So if you've been working in data science and using Python, some of these logos should look familiar to you. Uh, data science, the data science ecosystem in Python has really, really, really grown up in the last 10 years. So um, just as a reminder, maybe for some of those of you who don't know the history, you know, the R programming language was created by statisticians primarily for statistics work. That is not true in Python. Python was, was created as a general purpose programming language. And some of these scientific computing libraries, these kind of um, fundamental building blocks like manipulating arrays and uh, performing statistical analysis, making data visualization, those were tacked on later. Those came later in some of these great projects. And that ecosystem is very mature now. Um, it has a lot of development attention. There are hundreds, thousands of conference talks about these different packages. Um, so you may have seen some of them. Really, really great ecosystem. Python is a great uh, language for doing machine learning work. However, Many of those packages that I just showed, they are primarily designed for doing work on a single physical machine. So uh, many of them have no concept of sort of distributed versions of the algorithms that they implement of their APIs. Some can be maybe hooked into other things, but uh, the real focus in those projects is on functionality working on a single machine. And so what that means is if you have big data or a big idea, using those libraries by themselves, you might hit some limitations. And I, I wanna describe what I mean by this. So um, when I say big data, I don't necessarily mean in a machine learning context that your training data are too large to fit on your laptop. That is certainly one case of what people call big data. Uh, you know, that you need, you have so much data that it doesn't fit on your kind of main workstation. Uh, but big data and big ideas, this can also mean you want to do an amount of work that can't be done in a reasonable amount of time on your machine. So maybe you have like what would be considered a moderate size data set that fits comfortably on your laptop, but you want to experiment with many, many, many different combinations of hyperparameters, or you want to try many different uh, combinations of, of features, or you want to train a very, very, very deep, um, or, or I guess just generically large model. So when, when you hear me for the rest of this talk, talk about, you know, I'll say big data or big problems or big ideas. Um, I really wanna stress as, as a first case that I don't just mean literally the training data or the evaluation data are large because I know when I've talked about Dask with people in the past or I've talked about Spark or, or Ray or some of these other things that I'll talk about, there is sometimes some resistance and people say, well, my data sets aren't that large. I don't really need distributed computing. Um, and I, I, I want to pitch to you that you may be limiting your kind of creative expression. You may be limiting the space of ideas that you search by not considering some of these distributed alternatives. 
Okay. Anyway, so I also want to stress that even if you think your data set is not that large, it actually might be too large for your laptop or for your uh, main workstation. Maybe that's a virtual machine from a cloud provider or something like that. So there is this really, really good blog post by Wes McKinney. Wes McKinney, the creator of Pandas, the popular data frame library in Python, called 10 Things I Hate About Pandas. And he also um, spent, spent a year or two giving a conference talk version of this at, at various data science conferences. And in that talk, Wes McKinney, the creator of Pandas, the person who knows more about it than any other person on the planet, said that his rule of thumb for Pandas is that you should look at the size of your data set on disk and expect to have five to 10 times that much RAM when you're working with it in memory. So think about that, right? If you have a three gig data set on disk, Wes McKinney thinks that you might need 15 to 30 gigabytes of memory just to do kind of typical Panda stuff with it. So uh, I also would stress to you that you can get into the, my single workstation is not big enough situation pretty quickly. All right, and so when you're doing, when you get into this situation, when your machine learning work requires more physical resources than you have, you have, I, I'd say three classes of option. And so the first is to just use less data. Um, so that is to put all of your data somewhere else other than that workstation, and then use a query engine to ask for a summary of that data that is of a reasonable size that can fit on your workstation. Um, and there are tons of tools for this. There are uh, data warehouses, you know, there, there are tools like, um, excuse me, like Amazon Redshift, Snowflake, BigQuery. There are tools that will let you write queries over collections of files. That's like um, Presto, Amazon Athena, which is built on Presto, Drill, Spark SQL. There are relational databases. Relational databases uh, are a popular and formidable technology that have been around forever. For example, PostgreSQL, MySQL, things like that. So that's one option, right? You put your data somewhere else that can store it. And then when you're working with it in memory for a machine learning workflow, you basically ask those query engines, those databases, whatever they may be, to give you back uh, a smaller subset or maybe a downsampled subset. Another option that you have is to continue using those single machine libraries, um, but just to get a larger machine. So that's to go out to a cloud provider or um, you know, you can always buy some, buy, buy a physical machine yourself, you know, upgrade, upgrade your laptop, whatever you want to do. But those things are going to cost money. And, and I want to stop here and explain exactly what I mean by cost money. Because of course, using BigQuery costs money, right? Uh, running PostgreSQL on Amazon RDS costs money. When you find yourself doing what's called vertically scaling, which is getting a single larger machine, it can be difficult to fully utilize those resources. So you can go get a gigantic VM from any of the main cloud providers, but you're gonna be paying for the time that you're holding that resource, not the amount of usage of that resource once it's run, right? So if you go and get, you know, 256 gigs of RAM, but only during a, like a very, very intense part of your training are you actually getting close to using most of that memory. And the most of the rest of the time while you're making plots or doing whatever, you are not utilizing that, that is kind of wasted money. You're paying for capacity that you don't need. So this is what I mean when I say that vertically scaling and getting one larger machine uh, can be really expensive really fast. And then finally, you have the option to use multiple machines. Um, and so in this way, you know, putting together four or five machines that add up to the same physical resources as one larger one might be cheaper because a lot of these uh, frameworks for using multiple machines for data processing and machine learning, they have features like adaptive scaling or, or what you might have heard referred to as auto scaling, which means that you can kind of add and remove machines as the demand of your workload changes. So there are some very general frameworks for this that might be Dask, uh, Ray, Apache Spark, um, Kubeflow, things like that. Some of the machine learning frameworks also have a very, very specific multi-machine implementation of their frameworks. And that's like XGBoost, LightGBM, TensorFlow, PyTorch. So like I just mentioned, some of these machine learning frameworks have their own distributed training interfaces. That's you know TensorFlow, XGBoost, LightGBM, PyTorch. Um, those can be very powerful, but they can be very limiting in a couple ways. So the main way that I found that to be limiting is 
they often expect that your training data or your evaluation data are pretty much already set up and ready to go. And so what that means is if the work of exploratory data analysis has to be parallelized, these frameworks are not gonna help you with that. If the work of feature engineering, if you want that to be distributed over multiple, machi multiple machines, these frameworks are not gonna help you with that. So if you use distributed LightGBM, distributed XGBoost, those frameworks are gonna expect that the training data have already be pre been prepared. You've already done your feature engineering. You've already you know, read, pulled down files from an object store or done whatever you did. Um, and they're not, those, those frameworks at their core level are not gonna help you with all of that other necessary pipelining work that professional data scientists spend a lot of their time on. So these can, can be very powerful, but they, but they can be very limiting. And so this is why general purpose frameworks like Spark and DAST have become so popular amongst data engineers and data scientists, uh, because they allow you to express arbitrary distributed computation so that you can do your feature engineering, feature selection, you can do your you know, data manipulation, all of that stuff, and then pipe that data straight to model training um, and kind of have that all handled by one framework. And so first I wanna talk about the ways that Spark and Dask are similar. Um, and in a little bit, I'll talk about how they're different. And, and the reason that I talk so much about Spark in this you know, talk that is in name about Dask is because I, you know, Spark is such an established name. It's so popular. It's used by many enterprises um, that I know that when I le first learned Dask, it was easiest for me to grasp those concepts as comparisons to the equivalent concepts from Spark. So first, both Spark and Dask have distributed machine learning training libraries. So in Spark, you can use things like Spark ML, MML Spark, XGBoost for J. Uh, in Dask, you have Dask ML, XGBoost and LightGBM Dask, TS Fresh, things like this. And so what this means is when I say that they have distributed training frameworks, this means that you can basically write code that describes a machine learning model, describes the hyperparameters, describes where to find the data, things like that, and get back a model object without you needing to write any low level code that describes, say, the IP addresses of every worker in a network. And, uh, you know, whether to use MPI or TCP sockets or something else to communicate between them, things like that. Both of these frameworks also offer distributed data structures. So in Spark, you have the RDD and the data frame. Um, in Dask, you have similar collections. These are called the Dask collections. You have things like the Dask bag, which is similar to an RDD from Spark, the Dask data frame, the Dask array. And we'll talk a lot more about those in a couple of slides, but what I mean by distributed data structures is data structures that in your code look like a data frame or an array or a list or a map kind of sitting in main memory on your main workstation, but which are actually broken into multiple pieces that might be located on physically different machines. Um, and both Spark and Dask will handle translating the code that you ask them to run into operations on each of those individual pieces on the different machines. It's really cool. We'll talk about it later. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about how these two frameworks are different. So first I'd like to talk about some of the advantages of Dask over Spark. So these are some reasons that you might prefer Dask to Spark. The biggest one I think is that Dask is Python first. Uh, Dask is an ecosystem of libraries that are all written in Python and Dask is Python all the way down. I mean, you know, most scientific computing libraries in Python end up having some C and Fortran in them, but, but it's, as far as at the user level, all of the code that you interact with is Python all the way down. And none of the core logic of Dask is written in any language other than Python. This is different from Spark, right? Spark is implemented primarily on the JVM in Java and Scala. And when you use PySpark to run Spark operations from Python, What's actually happening is that your Python code is still being kind of shipped around the cluster and still being orchestrated by code that's running in the JVM. And so that means that you have this experience in Spark where if something goes wrong, you don't get a Python stack trace, you get like a gnarly Scala stack trace that can be really difficult to understand if you are not familiar with Spark's um, kind of JVM interface or if you're not familiar with those languages at all. 
That's not going to be your experience with Dask. In Dask, you are always going to get Python errors. You're always going to be working in the Python ecosystem. The next big feature that Dask offers, which Spark doesn't, is API parity with the PyData libraries. And so what that means is there are these projects in the Dask ecosystem that try to give an API that is very, very close to the API that you already know and love from those packages I showed a few scenes ago. You know, um, scikit-learn and pandas and numpy. I know it's controversial that I pronounce it that way. Some of you may say numpy, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, the maintainers from those projects are also involved with the Dask project. So when you write code in Dask ML, it doesn't feel like you're writing Dask code. It looks and feels like scikit-learn. When you use Dask ML's grid search CV, it looks and feels just like scikit-learn's grid search CV. When you work on a Dask data frame that is spread over multiple machines, your code doesn't really have too many details that suggest that that data frame is spread over multiple machines. Your code looks just like Pandas code. And what this means is that there is less friction in converting an existing code base from a kind of a single machine type of code base into one that can work in a distributed manner. So this is another powerful benefit that Dask has over Spark. In Spark, if you've ever had the experience of converting kind of you know, pandas and scikit-learn type of code into something that runs on Spark, you know it feels like writing Spark code. There's a lot of new Sparky stuff that you have to learn. The next benefit that Dask has to Spark is finer grain control over uh, the work that the cluster does. So in both Dask and Spark, these frameworks will take in your uh, basically requests for the work to be done. They'll create a directed acyclic graph and then they'll execute that graph in order. In Spark, there are more guardrails in place, right? You tend to have to work within the functional programming primitives like uh, map, reduce, filter, group by key, things like this. In Dask, that isn't true. Uh, the Dask graph, you can just do kind of arbitrary stuff, whatever you'd like. And so what that means is for kind of highly custom applications, you have the ability to express them in, in a way that Dask can handle without needing to twist yourself into knots too much, the way that you might have to to fit them into Spark's guidelines. And then finally, at least as of the writing of this talk, Dask had first class support for multi-dimensional arrays and the distributed collections in Spark did not. So if you're working with data that involves multi-dimensional arrays, Dask might be for you. Now, to be fair, there are reasons to prefer Spark to Dask. I think the, the, the biggest one is the presence of a SQL engine. So, there are projects in Dask to use SQL that allow you to use SQL over Dask data frames. Um, these are projects like Fugue, like Dask SQL, like Blazon SQL, but those projects are not as mature as Spark SQL. Spark SQL is used in enterprises all over the world, um, has been around for several years. It's a very, very mature project. So if you have, um, you know, hundreds of, tens of gigabytes of, of data, maybe hundreds of gigabytes of data or more, and you are mainly just like cranking out complicated SQL over that data, Spark is probably going to be a better choice for you than Dask, at least right now. Another thing that Spark offers are these high level optimizations on the work that's done. So remember uh, a minute or two ago, I mentioned that Dask has allows, you allows for finer grain control over the task graph, right? Well, what you trade off there is that Dask has less guardrails, and that means that there's less opportunity for Dask to optimize your code for you. So when you write a Spark pipeline that is doing a bunch of steps chained together, and you know at step 10 of the pipeline, there is like a filter by with an explicit list of keys to filter by, Spark will be smart enough to know that it can take that filter and apply it all the way at the top of the pipeline and filter out any other data that will eventually filter below um, to reduce the memory consumption of the whole thing. As an example, things like that. Uh, Dask can do some of those things, but because there are less guardrails in Dask, Dask necessarily has less powerful automatic optimizations. So that might be another reason to prefer Spark. Um, Spark has this, another like very mature project in the Spark ecosystem called GraphX for doing uh, for working with distributed large graphs and using uh, graph traversal algorithms. 
There is a similar project in the Dask ecosystem, but it is not as mature. So if you're working on large scale graph problems, you might prefer Spark. But I'll, I'll tell you, to be honest, I don't have firsthand experience with the Dask equivalent for working on um, graph problems. So I would be happy to be corrected if, if someone does have that experience. And then finally, I think another you know, big, very practical reason to prefer Spark is if you are not working in Python, Dask is not for you. In Spark, you can access the Spark APIs through Java, Scala, um, other JVM languages like Kotlin, R, and Python. If your team, if your organization is a Scala shop or an R shop, you are not going to be able to just take your code and run it in Dask. So if you are committed to R, you're committed to Scala, you know, as a company, as an organization, Spark is probably going to be a better choice for you. All right. That is the extent of what I want to say about Dask versus Spark. There's way more that, that could be said about this, and there are people who are much more qualified than me uh, to say it. If you're interested, most of what I just described was taken directly from the Dask documentation uh, that answers these questions of how Dask is compared to, compares to Spark. So you can go to this link in the Dask documentation, and you'll probably see some things that are familiar to you that I just covered, but you'll see more details and other, other links and, and things like that. Okay, before we jump into the, set, the next section, I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. Okay, so next let's talk about what Dask even is. Now that you've heard you know, a little bit of the reason for why you might want to use Dask. I wanna make a point before I start. Uh, Dask does work very well on a single machine. And there are reasons to prefer it for a single machine. Um, Dask can do some really nice things. For example, if you have a data frame that is too large to work with in memory, you can use Dask data frame to read it in instead. And Dask will transparently handle moving data back and forth between main memory and disk. So there are, there are cool things that you can do with Dask on a single machine and they will work well. I don't want you to walk away from this talk thinking that Dask is only a distributed computing framework for using, you know, doing stuff on multiple machines. However, for the rest of this talk, I'm only going to talk about using Dask to orchestrate some of the computations that are common in machine learning workflows on multiple machines. All right. So um, you may have heard me say this earlier, but Dask is not a library. Dask is an ecosystem of many libraries. And I'm gonna to refer to many of them with this text in brackets throughout the rest of the talk. But if you wanna see all of the libraries that are currently in the ecosystem, you can go to uh, github.com slash Dask. Okay, so let's talk about a really important project called Distributed. Um, Dask Distributed is an implementation of basically how Dask takes work that you describe in your local Python code and pushes it out to a cluster to do that work. So I think that this image on the right describes it really well. This was actually not taken directly from the Dask documentation. This image was created by one of the Dask maintainers who I've cited here uh, and posted in a GitHub issue, deep in some GitHub issue that I found from search and has not yet been, that, that issue has not yet gone anywhere. This hasn't been included, but this is an accurate description of how the distributed scheduler works. So I really, really like it. And it's really important to notice here these kind of three levels vertically, the client, the scheduler, and the workers. So all DAS code that uses distributed works like this. The client is an object that you talk to in your code in a notebook or your, you know, wherever you're writing the logic of your processing, of your job. Your code talks to a client. The client then knows how to take the instructions from your Python code and describe it to a scheduler. So the client knows how to talk to the scheduler. The scheduler is a process that knows um, basically how to look at a Dask graph and then orchestrate multiple workers that will handle actually doing the work described in the graph. And so the scheduler will talk to each of these workers in a cluster and it will handle those low level details like, you know, what, um, Am I talking to them over TCP sockets? What ports are we communicating on? Um, how do I expect to get logs back from those workers? 
what specialized resources do those workers have? Maybe some of those machines have GPUs. Maybe some of those machines have larger disks or larger memory, things like that. Um, and I'll describe this process in a moment. But the reason that I say it's really important to look at these three kind of vertical levels is that when there are a lot of these different uh, projects in the Dask ecosystem that allow you to plug in different underlying implementations of the things at each of these levels, different clients, different schedulers, and different types of workers. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, before I go too much farther, I also want to note that a worker in the language of Dask is a process. It's not a physical machine. So the scheduler and the worker, you could pip install Dask right now and run these commands in a terminal. You could run Dask scheduler and you could run Dask worker three times all on your laptop and create a little cluster right on your laptop. So uh, that's an important place where I think that people maybe get tripped up. In other frameworks, the word worker refers to one physical machine. In Dask, it's a process. And so what that means is you could have one physical machine with two workers on it or four workers on it. And I won't go into why you might do that, but I'd be happy to talk about that in the question and answer at the end, if people are interested. Okay, so um, let's look at this picture one more time, right? Client, scheduler, and worker. The client only needs to know how to talk to the scheduler. The scheduler only needs to know how to accept communications from the client and talk to the workers. And workers only need to know how to accept instructions from the scheduler. Given that, there are a bunch of these libraries that you can use to plug in different implementations of the schedulers, workers, and clients. Um, and I'll just go over a few of them. So there's a project called Dask Yarn. If you already have an existing HDFS cluster, maybe you're running a, a Spark cluster in EMR or Dataproc in Google Cloud, you can use the Dask Yarn project to run Dask clusters, uh, a Dask cluster directly on those resources. And so what will happen is Yarn will become the place where the Dask scheduler runs. And then your kind of compute nodes in that cluster become Dask workers. If you're working in high performance computing, and you're used to using you know, MPI or job queue or something like that, there are projects for running a Dask cluster on an existing um, high performance computing cluster where you can basically plug in and take Dask applications and run them as MPI applications, something like MPI run. So really cool projects there. If your preferred way of getting infrastructure is Kubernetes, you can use the Dask Helm chart to basically Helm install Dask. Uh, or the Dask Kubernetes project. And so in that case, the scheduler becomes a, a pod in Kubernetes. And then each worker is a pod that is known to the scheduler. And then there's like another Dask uh, cube scheduler service thing. But long story short, those libraries allow you to run Dask and Kubernetes. If you are running all your infrastructure in the public cloud, you can use the Dask Kubernetes project to work on one of the hosted Kubernetes offerings like uh, Google Compute Engine, Amazon uh, EKS, Azure EKS, every major cloud provider has a hosted Kubernetes thing. You can also use the Dask Cloud Provider package. This is a really cool package with a collection of um, basically all of the other non-Kubernetes ways to run Dask on a public cloud provider. So you can use AWS ECS, for example, which is a service that allows you to run um, tasks that are expressed in Docker containers. You can use Azure ML workspaces, DigitalOcean uh, Docker droplets. You can run um, just on regular virtual machines in these cloud providers. So there are a lot of different ways to run Dask and a lot of different types of infrastructure. And what you'll see in the demo part of this talk is that this separation means that your code doesn't have to change if you swap in a different type of scheduler, unless you're doing very, very, very low level stuff, which, which is rare. So as long as the scheduler is kind of a you know, distributed compliant scheduler, your code doesn't need to change if you switch from say a local cluster on your laptop to Amazon ECS, or then maybe your company moves to Azure and you go to Azure ML workspaces, none of the rest of your Dask code will need to change. Just that little bit that says, how do I set up the cluster? Basically, where is the scheduler? It's a really, really nice separation. Let me take another sip of water because this part is going to get a little long. Okay. 
Okay, so let's talk about how Dask does its work. So I mentioned earlier, when you describe work to Dask, Dask arranges that work in an ordered graph of tasks. And there are five steps here. The first is graph construction. And so in this case, this is just Dask figuring out what you even wanna do. Um, and this graph you can think of as a Python dictionary where each element, each key in the dictionary is a unique task ID. And then the value of the dictionary is basically a function call and a dictionary of arguments to the function call. Um, and this can be arbitrarily nested and that nesting is how dependencies are expressed. After the graph has been constructed, there is some optimization. So as I mentioned, Dask cannot do the, you know, it, its ability to do automatic optimization of a task graph is not as powerful as Spark because Dask has less guardrails, but there are still some things that Dask is able to do um, especially if your graph is only made up of kind of standard tasks from Dask libraries, where Dask is able to peek ahead and maybe rearrange some things to preserve the functional correctness of your graph while limiting maybe the memory usage or um, compute time or something like that. After the graph has been maybe reordered a little for optimization, then you get to the step of serialization. So in serialization, the graph is sent over the wire from the client. So remember the client is like, your Jupyter notebook or your Python session on your laptop or whatever. The client is written to bytes and sent over the wire to the scheduler and the scheduler then forwards it on to workers. And so this is the point where the graph is not gonna be changed. And now the scheduler has gotten a description of the work that you would like it to do. After serialization, the scheduler looks at the graph and does what's called scheduling. This is an ongoing process where the scheduler looks at the order of tasks to be completed it looks at the work that's being done currently on workers for other task graphs. You know, it looks at their available uh, memory, their available CPU. And then the, the, the scheduling step means that the scheduler breaks up the work and tells, tells the workers, okay, I need you to execute this task, return this data, do whatever. And then finally we get into execution. And in execution, the workers receive instructions from the scheduler that says, please run this task. Here is the, where to get the input data. Here's where to store the output data. And then the workers do the work. And while they're doing the work, they report back to the scheduler their logs. They report back information like, um, I just tried this task, but it failed. So I'm going to try it again. Um, you can optionally configure timeouts. So the workers might say, I just tried to complete this work. You said I had to finish within 50 seconds. And after 50 seconds, it wasn't done. So I killed this task. It failed. Things like that. And this process is, all of these processes are ongoing. Um, each time that you run more code from the client, more instructions will be popped onto the graph um, or you know, might create like a different kind of parallel graph. That graph will be optimized, sent to the scheduler, et cetera, et cetera. This is an ongoing process. If you would like, you can create arbitrary custom graphs in Dask, arbitrary kind of custom workflows of work that you'd like to do. And you can do that with a project called Delayed, uh, which ships in the, the main Dask package. So this is a very short example taken from the Dask documentation. Um, but I wanna draw your attention to this function called Dask.Delayed. So the first thing in parentheses after each of those is another function that's already defined. So inc stands for increment. This is a function that takes in an integer and adds one to it. Double takes in an integer and doubles it. Add takes in two integers and returns their sum. By wrapping these functions in this function called dask.delayed, what we're doing here is saying, I actually am deferring this computation. I don't wanna run this code yet. What I'd like to do is just say that, for example, I'm gonna have an output called C, which is the result of calling add on A and B, and then A and B come from other function calls. When you run through that for loop, nothing will have actually happened yet. This is just basically setting up a graph like the one that you see on the right. And then it won't be until you ask Dask for that result, until you say, hey Dask, please compute this result and give me the answer, that it will kick off all of that computation. And so this allows you to build up this ordered graph. It allows you to express the dependencies between these different function calls um, and basically not execute it until you're ready. So that's kind of the, uh, that's a fairly low level way to tell Dask to do some work. The next level up from that 
are the DASC collections. So these are data structures that look like data structures you're used to working with in a non-DASC context, where basically you express computations on those data structures, and then your code gets turned into a DAS graph without you ever needing to think about the graph. Um, and so there are three of these data, these data structures. They're called DAS collections. The first is a bag. A bag is, you can think of it as a list. Um, it doesn't have a concept of rows and columns, but it does have a concept of being iterable. It has a concept of a first thing and a last thing, and it supports the operations from functional programming like map and reduce, similar to a Spark RDD. The next data, the next DAS collection is called an array. Um, this has a concept of rows and columns um, and actually other dimensions if you'd like. And this follows the NumPy API. So this will look and feel like a, a matrix from NumPy. And then there's a project called, uh, not a project, excuse me, a DAS collection called the data frame, which looks like a pandas data frame. This image that I put on the left of the screen is another one taken from that random DAS issue that I found. Um, this was written by one of the DAS maintainers. And I think it really clearly describes what's happening in these collections. So I'd like to just talk through this for, for a moment. Everything that you see in blue, so the things that say NumPy array, the things that say chunk zero and chunk one, those are NumPy arrays. That means it's a single data structure in memory of a single process. And the pink, kind of pink red uh, bar that you see at the top of the screen that says Dask array, that is a Dask array. So let's talk through what this means. On the left-hand side, we have our six element NumPy array, right? When you call dot sum on that array, those data are stored contiguously in memory, uh, the, the main memory accessible by a single process. And what's going to happen? Some code inside of NumPy is going to walk through each of those elements of the array. It's going to accumulate a sum as it goes. And then it's going to give you back the number with the sum of the array. When you call dot sum on a Dask array, the Dask array is actually a collection of multiple smaller individual arrays. And so what it's going to do is it's going to turn that into a small Dask task graph that says, OK, for each worker, for each chunk of this array that you have, call, dot, call the numpy.sum method on your chunks, send me back the sum of all your sums, and then I'll add all those together. And that's kind of the global sum of the whole array. So this is the like, very simple example of how the Dask array works. But Dask has implemented many you know, kind of more complicated operations, including generic operations like map a function over every row of an array or every chunk of an array. Um, but that's kind, of, that's kind of what's happening. Hopefully, that gives you a bit, bit of a flavor. OK, so we started at the low level, right, creating arbitrary graphs that delayed. Then we went up a level to these data collections. This is a machine learning and data science meetup. So it's important that we talk about the next level, which is machine learning. So once you have these primitives, like these distributed data structures, then you can create these higher level workflows like data visualization and machine learning. And there are a couple of projects um, for doing you know, various machine learning tasks on Dask collections. Dask ML is officially maintained by the Dask maintainers. It is intended to have an API similar to scikit-learn. And you can use the projects in there to do things like um, excuse me, uh, you know, do a grid search over multiple training runs of a scikit-learn model using data that are stored in these DAS collections. XGBoost and LightGBM also both have built-in DAS interfaces that allow you to uh, provide data that's in DAS array or DAS data frame format and get back an XGBoost or LightGBM model. And you can see a short example of this on the right-hand side of the screen. This code should look very familiar to you if you've ever used LightGBM in a non-Dask setting, right? So um, I'm using Dask Array here. Uh, Dask Array.random looks and feels very similar to NumPy.random. We have a Dask LGBM regressor class that looks and feels very, very similar to the normal scikit-learn LGBM regressor. It takes in the same parameters. Um, and then when you call that fit, you still pass an X and a Y, just like you're used to in other scikit-learn estimators. The only difference is that that X and Y those are distributed collections instead of data that is sitting there in main memory uh, on the client. OK, uh, let me take another sip of water while you read this.
All right, it's important that I note here a little bit of history. So if you leave this talk inspired to go uh, train machine learning models using Dask, and you're really interested in XGBoost, you might Google XGBoost on Dask, and you might find Stack Overflow answers or other search results that lead you to a project called Dask-XGBoost. That project should be considered basically deprecated. Um, in August, 2019, the core of that project was merged into XGBoost, the main XGBoost project. And since then, the XGBoost maintainers have been working on an XGBoost native implementation of training on Dask. So as XGBoost core library changes, so does the Dask interface. So uh, if you're interested in doing XGBoost work on Dask, you should just pip install XGBoost and then it, you know, install, uh, excuse me, import XGBoost.Dask. The same is true of LightGBM, though um, we are about a year behind our <laughs> friends at XGBoost. So the Dask LightGBM project should also be considered deprecated. It will be archived soon. Um, and that project, those maintainers have agreed to merge it into LightGBM. And that happened in November of 2020. Okay. With that, the next part of the talk is a live demo. So let's get into that. And then I'd be happy to answer any, any questions that anyone has. All right, so uh, maybe you have seen cooking shows where, you know, they're cooking, they're cooking a turkey and they show you how to put on all of the seasonings and everything. And then they say, put it in the oven for eight hours. And then five, they come back from commercial break and the turkey's done. I've done something similar with this demo. I have set up a little bit of stuff ahead of time. I already have a notebook running, but to prove to you that I'm not cheating, um, all of this, and I'll have this link up at the end as well. All of the code that you're going to see me run and the code to create these notebooks, you can go to my GitHub repo. You can look at the folder for this talk and you'll be able to link directly to that code and grab it, do whatever you want with it. It has a permissive open source license. If you want to start a company based on this code, like go for it. Uh, all that code will be right there for you to look at. But I've already got this running uh, right here locally. And I'd like to show you two examples. The, in the first, we're going to use Dask on a local cluster. So this will be a three worker cluster on my laptop. And then in the second example, we'll go to AWS using AWS Fargate. Um, because the AWS stuff takes a little while to, to spin up to create resources, I'm going to get that started. Then we'll come back to the local cluster example. So in this example, um, I'm going to read in some details of an image of a Docker image that I've already pushed to the AWS Elastic Container Registry, the public version of that. Um, don't worry if you don't understand this code. This is all described in the README of this repository. And what I'm going to do is use a project called Dask Cloud Provider to create a Dask cluster on AWS Fargate. So AWS Fargate, this is a part of the AWS Elastic Container Service. What's going to happen here is for basically uh, virtual machines in AWS are going to be provisioned, running a Docker daemon. And then this image that I've already pushed to ECR is going to be pulled and used in a scheduler and three Dask workers. So I'm going to just get that started and we'll come back to that later. Don't worry if that didn't make sense. OK, so let's get started on local cluster. And let me zoom this up a little bit so people can see. OK. So the first thing that I'm going to do is initialize the cluster. I'm going to tell Dask that I want three workers. And because this is all on my local machine, these workers are going to be three separate processes, not three different machines. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now that the cluster is up, we can look at this diagnostic dashboard. Nothing's running right now, but we can take a look at the workers and we can see here are their addresses. They've each been allowed to use one thread. Right now, they're using very little of the available CPU. And the two gigs of memory that I'm allowing this Docker container to use has been divided roughly be evenly between them. Okay, nothing really going on there yet. We'll come back to that. The next step in, in training a, a machine learning model on Dask is to create a Dask data structure. So here I'm going to use Dask Array. Um, this project is built in when you pip install Dask. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the scikit-learn datasets module, create 
these data sets, which are going to be NumPy arrays, and then turn them into Dask arrays. This is one of many different ways to create Dask arrays. Uh, it's convenient for the purpose of a demo. This is not the only way. So you don't always have to have all the data sitting here in memory on the client and then push it out to Dask. There are um, other ways to basically create that data in function calls that run on each worker so that your client never has to hold all the training data. Okay, so that should just take a second. And what we should see, if we take a look at this, is that this DX object that I've set up, it's an array, it's gonna have 10,000 rows and 100 columns, all the data are floats. And there's this concept called chunk size. So remember before, uh, I can actually just go back to the slide. Remember we talked about this idea that the Dask collections, they look to your code like a single array, but they're broken into multiple pieces, right? Those pieces are called chunks. So in this case, the entire data set is 10,000 rows and 100 columns, but it's broken into chunks that are each 1,000 rows and 100 columns. And so if I do dx and partitions, what you'll see is this entire data set is broken into 10 smaller pieces. And those are spread over my three workers. However, none of them have been materialized in memory yet. Right now, they're just lazily evaluated. So if I do something like dx.sum, that comes back immediately, but it doesn't actually sum the values. This is where it becomes important to understand this notion that DAS computations are lazy. So remember when I talked about delayed, uh, where were we here? Remember when we talked about delayed, I mentioned that none of this computation will run until you ask for an output, right? The same thing is happening here. So in this case, calling dot sum, it returns basically uh, a future, if you're familiar with that terminology, or similar to like a, a promise in JavaScript. It returns basically an object that if I ask for the result of that object, then a bunch of work would be done. And I'm going to show you that right now. So if instead I call doc compute and we go over here, now we're going to see some stuff happening. Now they're, oh look, it already ran. That was really fast. But this view shows us that uh, each of these rows represents one of the workers and all of these tasks ran like, I don't know, something called transfer sum, something called deserialize sum. That's basically sending that data back to the client. And now what we got was the actual sum of this data set. Pretty cool, right? Okay. Because I want to maybe train multiple models, every time that I train a model, I don't want to have to redo that computing step. So see here at the beginning, will it let me zoom in on these? If you can see here, uh, won't let me. These beginning tasks are the tasks that are just materializing the data. They're taking the data and moving it out to the DAS cluster, storing it on the workers. I don't want to have to redo that every time I retrain the model. Right, I'm going to keep iterating on this model with the same data, and I have enough available memory. So what I'm going to do is uh, use an operation called persist, which says, hey, do that work of computing this data set, of, of, of materializing it in memory on the workers, but then just leave it there. Just leave it there, and I'm going to keep reusing it. So I'm going to call persist, and then another function from DAS called wait, which says block execution until all of the work of persisting is done. And that ran very fast because I'm using a very small data set. But if the way that you created this data was something like reading in thousands of files from an object store, then this would be an important pattern to kind of block and wait until it was all done. And now we should be good to go. The data is available in memory. And now if I ask for the sum again, it's going to be extremely, oops, sorry. Still need to compute. It's going to be extremely quick because that data doesn't need to be regenerated. All right, so now that we've done that, let's train a LightGBM model. I am gonna import lightgbm.desk. I'm gonna use a LightGBM regressor since this is a regression problem. And if you've ever used LightGBM, these parameters should look familiar to you. I just made these up. Uh, I mean, not made them up, sorry. I chose the values somewhat randomly. You, we can mess around with them a little bit. Um, but all of these work exactly the same way as they would in a non-DASC setting. 
So I'm going to initialize the estimator and then call fit. And if we go look right here, you should see that we have some work going on. And what you'll see when you do light GBM training is first these train port tasks will fire. I think look at the task graph. I already missed the train port ones. So first those train port tasks will fire. That's going to run once per worker. And that's trying to find an open port on each worker for light GBM to use for inter-worker communication. So remember when I talked about these machine learning frameworks, how some of them have created their own distributed training interfaces, right? Light GBM is the same. Its code is written in C++. There's a version that uses TCP sockets and a version that uses MPI, but the actual distributed training process of Light GBM is not using DAS. So what we're using DAS for is to basically set up our data and then run a Light GBM worker on each machine. And so what you'll see when you train a model is you'll then have one of these train part tasks on each worker. Each of these tasks is going to collect up all of those chunks of the data set that are sitting on that worker and then use those to train a distributed light GBM model. And we can take a look at the model. If we call the predict method, we're also going to get back a Dask array. So this is really powerful too. You can use the Dask estimators to uh, work with prediction data that are larger than your machine. So if you need to do a large, large amount of batch predictions, or you just need to do them quickly and you want to throw a lot more machines processing power at them, the Dask interface might be a good choice for you. So right now, my predictions are just a Dask array. Let's see how this is going. Oh, that's done. Good. OK. Um, before we look at the mean absolute error from this model, I want to just look at the, at the target just to be sure that um, you know, we know what we're looking at. So it looks like this data is roughly distributed between negative 630 and negative 420. And let's take a look at the mean absolute error. The Dask ML project, remember I said that this has an interface similar to scikit-learn, right? One of the things that it implements are these metrics functions that look and feel just like the scikit-learn equivalents, but they work on Dask collections. So in this case, my target and my predictions were Dask arrays. And I'm able to compute this metric without ever needing to have my predictions and my training data uh, or my evaluation data, excuse me, actually living in memory on my machine, which is cool. And we can see this little toy model got an MAE of 100, which seems pretty bad, given that the gap between the first percentile and the 99th percentile is about 200. So not great, but we could mess around with tuning that model if we want. And I, I won't do that right now. OK, the last thing that I want to demo is a version of this code running on AWS. So here I have set up a Fargate cluster. There's more documentation on this in the cloud provider docs. But you can see here that I had to provide a lot more arguments. And this is just because um, I'm setting up some cloud infrastructure. So I had to describe something about the networking, uh, how long to wait before shutting the whole cluster down, stuff like this. Now that I've created the cluster, let's close this. If I go to my AWS console and I go to the ECS console, you should see in AWS that I have this cluster running. And it has these tasks defined, one scheduler, three workers. And I can get the same type of diagnostic dashboard but now this dashboard is living on an AWS EC2 instance. This is not my laptop. And so I could scale this out to something much bigger than my available physical resources if I wanted. Other than that, all the rest of this code is identical to the code that I just ran. So all the rest of this code, this is the power of that abstraction that I talked about before. Remember this pattern of client and scheduler and worker. All of the differences in, 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 in the um, infrastructure are concentrated right here in how you set up the cluster and create a client for it. Other than that, look, everything is just kind of proceeding as it should. All of this code looks exactly the same. So my data, or excuse me, my code to create a data set, my code to persist the data, my code to train a model, none of this code needs to say 
hey, by the way, I'm running on AWS. Hey, by the way, here are these IP, these specific IP addresses. It kind of just works just by changing the cluster, which I think is a really powerful idea. And of course, we got like a similarly horrible model uh, because we we're using similar data and similar tiny hyperparameters, all running out in AWS. So you could follow the examples in this documentation and uh, go run distributed training of a gradient boosted decision tree on AWS today in less than 10 minutes for less than a dollar. Okay, before I go back to the slides, let me shut down that cluster so that I don't forget it for the rest of the weekend and cost myself a bunch of money. Shut it all down. All right, we have to stop everything. DAS Cloud Provider, by the way, will shut all of this stuff down for you automatically. I am just paranoid, so I'm doing it right now, but it's not, it's not as risky as I'm making it sound. Don't, don't be scared. Okay. So given all that, there's two more things that I wanna tell you. The first is you can try this demo yourself if you'd like. You can go to this link on my GitHub um, and I will be sure that this information is posted in a comment on uh, the meetup site after this talk, but you can go run this code, do it yourself. Everything here was open source and the AWS resources were less than a dollar for 20 minutes. If you prefer, you can also go try this free, uh, the free trial of Saturn Cloud, sign up, cost you nothing, click the big light GBM button, and you can run these examples there as well. Something like these examples. Okay, finally, I'd like to make a pitch. If any of you are interested in contributing to LightGBM, um, I, we really, really, really could use your help. So there's a lot of work to go on the Dask interface. Outside of the Dask interface, there is just lots of other work to be done on LightGBM uh, in general. We have been trying to put some effort into labeling issues as good first issues. So there are some things like adding type hints, fixing warnings from type checkers, things like this. If you are interested in contributing to open source, interested in contributing to LightGBM, we would greatly, greatly appreciate your, your time and your efforts and your contributions to making LightGBM better. And if you have any questions about that uh, or about anything else after today, you can contact me at, at any of these places. And with that, I just would like to say thank you so much for your time. I know this was a lot of material, um, but I really appreciate you all being with me here on a Saturday. And with that, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Could you talk more about maintaining like GBM? Uh, and also, I'm also curious about like, what made a uh, desk part of the scope of the light GBM project instead of like, you know, just having it in its own separate repository or something? Um, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to talk about that. And then, so let me tell you about that history. And then if you have other more specific questions about maintaining light GBM, yeah, I'd be happy to answer them. But let me tell you about the history. So light GBM, I actually um, just, I have another talk that's more focused on LightGBM specifically that uh, I want to pull up a slide from. <laughs> so give me one second. Okay, let me let me just start talking. So LightGBM came out of Microsoft Research. Um, the project was started as an open source project in 2016. It had existed for a little while at Microsoft before that. And let's see, where is this talk? I'm looking for... Recent developments in LightGBM. New developments in LightGBM, there we go. So this project started at Microsoft Research. Come on. Okay, open, yes. Okay, it doesn't wanna participate with me, that's okay. This project started at Microsoft Research in 27, in, in, uh, before 2016, it was open sourced. And a year later, um, the, the uh, an academic paper was published by the maintainers of LightGBM on a novel approach to doing distributed gradient boosted decision tree training on multiple machines. Um, that paper 
give me one second to try to pull this up again. Um, so I think it would be important to see the paper, but that paper described how to train a GBDT in a distributed way. And it, um, that code was merged into LightGBM. And so from that point, you know, LightGBM, I think that a lot of people might not know that LightGBM has a command line interface. It has a CLI. And that was the only way to do distributed training in, uh, in LightGBM. Here we go. Uh, and, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't even have that link in here. It's okay. That was this, the CLI was the only way to do distributed training in LightGBM. And this was kind of difficult because you had to basically set up chunks of your training data in files and then move them onto each worker machine. Then you had to fill out a text file with the IP addresses of every worker machine, copy that file around to a very specific location on each machine, and then SSH into each machine and run a CLI command pointing at the file on the parameter. So it's kind of difficult to do, right? Kind of difficult to set up. Shortly after that, a project at Microsoft called MML Spark, is still an actively maintained project, um, added LightGBM support on Spark. So Spark uses a project called SWIG, S-W-I-G, that basically allows you to create a Java interface to a C, a Java interface to a C++ library with a C interface. That thing is then used in Spark to do LightGBM training on Spark. And so then people have the ability to train LightGBM models on Spark. Okay, great. I mentioned before, right? Spark and DAS, they accomplish similar things. Um, they, those projects have similar ambitions. Spark is very popular. And this is great. But there were a couple downsides to that. And, and, and those downsides are mainly those same reasons that I gave why someone might prefer Dask to Spark. So if, you, uh, you know, if your data sets, for example, require some specialized processing that are implemented in Python libraries, like maybe you want to use some of the time series feature engineering from TSPRSH or something like that, combining that with PySpark, it can like kind of get kind of difficult, right? Because the Spark interface to LightGBM was maintained in this other project that yes, it was part of Microsoft, but it wasn't. When LightGBM changed, there was a lag until the Spark one changed, right? All of those things created friction in data scientists using Python to do distributed LightGBM training. Okay, so far so good. So there's a lot of things that were really difficult about this. The Dask LightGBM project was created in Dask in 2018 with no involvement from LightGBM maintainers. It was just, People in the Dask community who wanted to use LightGBM, they knew about Dask. They figured out how to basically like bootstrap all of the kind of difficult stuff I talked about before, the config file and the list of machines or whatever, and they did it in Dask. Um, then 10 months ago, I joined a Dask company. And part of my specific mission at that company was to improve the experience of using the open source Dask tools for machine learning workflows. And I already was a maintainer in LightGBM, so I had some influence in that project. This Dask LightGBM project, it was not super actively maintained. You know, it was done by um, volunteers on nights and weekends, and it lagged far behind LightGBM. So a breaking change to LightGBM or a new release wasn't often reflected in Dask LightGBM, right? And so I made this pitch let me share my screen again. I know this, this is a long-winded answer, but hopefully it's helpful. I made this pitch in the Dask community project, which is a, a repo that has no code. It's for meta discussions about Dask. And I made this pitch and I said, hey, I would like to propose that we move Dask LightGBM, that we merge it into LightGBM so that that project will change as LightGBM changes. And this wasn't a totally novel invention. XGBoost had done the same thing a year earlier. That proposal was accepted by um, you know, some of these faces. These are maintainers from, from Dask, distributed Dask ML. Um, this person, Jan, is the main creator and maintainer of Dask LightGBM. This person, Keith, is from NVIDIA working on, Q, on QML. So uh, you know, NVIDIA has, has a big role in the Dask ecosystem. Another NVIDIA person, uh, main, a maintainer from XGBoost, and we kind of got to this community consensus that it would make sense that people wanted to be able to use the kind of, you know, use Dask for data processing, use Dask for feature engineering, and that they wanted to train LightGBM models. So that is how we ended up 
with a native LightGPM implementation of Dask. And I've been really happy with how it's gone so far. So I forgot to mention it in the talk. If you pip install LightGPM today, you will not get any Dask features. That feature will be in the next release of LightGPM, which is coming out sometime in the next few weeks. Um, but I can just say anecdotally, the level of activity on that interface has been substantially higher in the three months that it's been a part of LightGBM than it was in the two years prior, where it was just maintained by um, you know, those one or two volunteers who, who were getting into it when they could on nights and weekends. So long answer, I hope that it, that answered your question. No, yeah. Are, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, well, I, it's more like me trying to understand uh, how Dask works. So, um, so I work mainly with and like uh, running codes on uh, high performance computing clusters. So, I, so uh, Dask um, looks like setting up a, a batch script uh, for uh, specifying the maybe the number of nodes I need um, on the cluster, et cetera. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I, I guess I was just wondering, going back to your point on that you can take Dask processes and run them as MPI, uh, yeah. how, would, how would that work? Yeah, let me show you. Um, so there is this project. I'll show you in the Dask MPI documentation. I was just oh, by the way, great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that. So there is this project called Dask MPI. And this, I, I personally don't, I have never worked in high performance computing. Um, a couple companies ago, we had Moab as a job scheduler just because one person had worked in an academic lab and knew it. And we did that instead of Airflow for a while. That's like my only <laughs> exposure to this stuff. Um, but the way that this works is in your Python code. So you set up your, your, your script in Python, you import Dask MPI. This should look like the MPI init call if you've ever like written, written an MPI program. And then you can actually take a script like that that has an MPI init and an MPI finalize and run it with MPI exec or MPI run just like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so the details of setting up the cluster are kind of in your Python code and then you do kind of whatever you want. And that task graph that I described gets translated into basically data get passed uh, using MPI. I, I really don't know, to be honest, much more beyond that. I've never used this project personally, but I that's at least like the kind of one tweet three bullet points description of how Dask MPI works. And so it, it might be useful in your case. Okay. Oh, and uh, can you also, uh, you said that you could um, in the Q and A say something more about, um, uh, you were talking about the multiple work, like why would you have a machine with multiple workers? Yeah. I was wondering uh, how would that be efficient? If I guess only if maybe the tasks don't have to be run simultaneously, I don't know. Yes, great question. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. There's a really good Dask document on this. Let's see if I can get it. There, one sec. Um, watch this. If none of you have ever seen, Google will limit your results to at most two results from the same domain but you can search, search an entire domain like that. And that still didn't get me to it. I'll have to find it later, but, but here's the reason. When you set up a Dask process, just wondering if I could get lucky here. <laughs> no, that's okay. When you set up the Dask process, each process is given a certain number of um, threads that it's allowed to use for its, its own work, right? And so there is some cost of, you know, there's some communication cost that's added with each additional worker process to manage because workers need to talk to the scheduler. They might need to move data between each other. Um, but on the other hand, processes allow you some isolation for threads on each machine. So if you want tasks to be able to work without competing for threads with each other, it could make sense to run two worker processes on the same machine. So for example, if you had one machine available to you with, uh, um, excuse me, with eight kind of logical CPUs, and you wanted to do something like, um, I don't know, like a grid search for machine learning or something, right? And you wanted to be training two models at the same time, it might be better 
to have that training pro to have that two training processes each run of four threads, and they completely utilize those threads for training instead of having basically like one training process use eight and have to wait, or having both of them trying to use eight and having contention. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah. And the other big case is using Dask only on one machine on your laptop. So like when I ran my three worker local cluster, there were no other machines available to me. That would have worked even if I didn't have access to the internet. So that's the other kind of like main reason. So in that case, you're kind of using Dask the way that you would use like the multi-processing library in Python or something, right? So you're like, it doesn't have to be for distribution over multiple physical machines. It can also just be like a way to do parallel scheduling even mm -hmm. on the Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I just had a question, James. Um, like, you know how you had your demo demo, and then w, demo AWS, um, you know, Python notebook? Yes. So the AWS was actually running on remote machines, right? So just coming back to your point, the demo part of it, that was on your local computer, actually. You know, the, de uh, the status that you kept showing, um, the DAS status, was that your actual machine sending it to, you know, so several different uh, workers? Yeah, so great, great, question. Sorry. The, great question. So this notebook that was just called demo that used this thing called local cluster, everything there was on my laptop. Um, there were three, there were four processes started right here in this container on my laptop, a scheduler and three workers. This dashboard was being hosted also off of my laptop. Mm -hmm. In this AWS example, the only thing on my laptop was this notebook. So this, so the scheduler was running in a container on AWS, that um, dashboard, uh, I don't have the address anymore. The dashboard address was an address, the public IP address of um, an EC2 instance in AWS. All the workers were in AWS. So everything was, was there in AWS. Okay, great. Any question? I also should say, I think I briefly mentioned this, um, the pattern that I used for this demo where I used an sklearn data sets function, generated some data, and then did dask array dot from array, from array, excuse me, that's a fine pattern for a demo. And I did that because it was, it was simple. But that pattern involved having all the training data on my laptop and then sending it over the wire through the scheduler to the workers. That's not a, re a feasible pattern for larger data sets. Um, and luckily, Dask supports a bunch of other options that don't involve doing that. So for example, I'll show you. Give me one second. Now, you know notebook rendering in, um, in GitHub is very hit or miss, so let's see. Just give it a second. Okay, perfect. So for example, you could instead use dash data frame dot read CSV. And if this was not a single file, you can use wildcard patterns. Um, what would happen is dash would create a task graph where each function in the graph was pull down one CSV from S3 and read it into a dash data frame locally. But that data would never touch my client. It would never be on my client. It would never be on the scheduler. Instead, each worker would get a batch of those function calls and they would execute them locally. And then they'd stitch together the pandas data frames they created from those CSVs in local memory on the worker. So in the demos that I showed, I was passing data from my laptop up to AWS. That is absolutely not a necessary part of the experience. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sure, no problem. Do you have any insight to like hardware choices? I mean, like for like EKS versus Fargate versus I don't know, EMR on AWS? Um, I, I, I can't give you any specific reason to prefer running on Kubernetes versus a EMR cluster versus your own thing on e EC2. That, that's a bigger discussion for any machine learning workload that's kind of bigger than desk. Um, so I, I don't really have anything too interesting to say about that. One thing that I will tell you that tripped me up a lot in the beginning is that uh, of working with Dask. 
I'll show you something. Um, I said it very quickly, you may not have caught it, but I, when I was talking about Dask on a single machine, I mentioned that Dask will, that was not the right thing. Dask memory, I always forget what this is. The Dask will transparently handle spilling some data to disk if you start to approach a large memory utilization, right? And that is documented right here. So once the memory utilization on a worker gets around 60%, Dask will start dumping the results of computation to disk. And then those kind of like tasks in the graph that return that data, those tasks will be modified to read it from disk instead of pulling it out of a cache in memory. So one thing I will tell you on hardware is you're not guaranteed with Dask to get a big loud out of memory exception if you don't provision enough memory. If it happens fast enough, that will happen. A worker will die and you'll get a message like this worker died, something's bad. But if you're just slowly inching up your memory utilization, what you might see in Dask is just your code takes a lot longer to run than you expected, but there are no error messages, nothing breaks and it does eventually complete successfully. So I, I do like to caution people, if you're doing work where you're trying to evaluate how fast something will be on Dask versus some other solution, you have to monitor your memory closely and be sure that you're giving Dask a fair shot, that all the work is being done only in distributed memory. What else? Okay. Oh, oh since good. Mentioned Kubernetes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, I am job searching. I'm a data scientist and machine learning professional, but um, I've just worked in Python and we've done like machine learning algorithms. I have not worked with Dask yet, but <laughs> I do keep seeing Kubernetes in like job applications where they, you know, they're like experience needed. But how does Kubernetes play into, you know, this? I, I have no experience with it. So since we mentioned it, I just wanted to know. Sure. No, no problem. Um, I, yeah, I would be happy, happy to tell you about that. So Kubernetes is a way to declaratively create infrastructure. Um, but it's a little, it's different than something like say Terraform or CloudFormation where you declare some spec about infrastructure, you kind of like fire it off one time and then everything gets created, right? Kubernetes is a, it's a collection of services that are constantly monitoring the state of your infrastructure and they're making sure that that state matches what you ask for. So for example, if you say, I want to run for just machines that have this much memory, this much CPU, they use this Docker image, whatever, Kubernetes will be monitoring that. And if one of those explodes or gets taken down, whatever reason, Kubernetes will automatically create a new one. It'll, it'll do stuff like that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but that's, that's a general idea. In the context of Dask, the way that people use Kubernetes with Dask is to create those uh, workers and schedulers. So when I say I want a Dask cluster with five workers, what'll happen is you might describe that to Dask Kubernetes and Dask Kubernetes will create what's called a pod in Kubernetes. Just think of that as like a machine running a process mm -hmm. that's running the scheduler. And then Dask Kubernetes will create five other pods that are each running a worker. And Dask Kubernetes will describe the networking between those machines in a way that Kubernetes understands without you needing to think about it. So there's a specific way that Kubernetes expects you to describe things like this machine is allowed to uh, talk to this other machine using TCP over port 12345. Dask Kubernetes will set all that up for you. Um, and then it'll give you some other nice kind of kubernetes -y management features. So another example is like, there's a Kubernetes specific way to uh, read logs out of containers, like logs from when they're spinning up, logs from their ongoing operation, Dask Kubernetes will handle that transparently so that you don't need to re relearn that. Um, there are built-ins for Kubernetes, you know, other things in the ecosystem for adding hard disk that is actually like maybe virtual volumes like AWS uh, EBS or mounting in a network file system or something like that. So if you want to give more storage cap on disk storage capability to your Dask workers, you can use EKS to, or excuse me, uh, Kubernetes 
to express that and to, to kind of set that up. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, so it looks like, I mean, the way you talk about it, I guess it's a separate tool in itself. So it's not like, uh, you know, I guess Python code that you would just adjust into and run from there, right? It's a separate tool in itself, it looks like. Yeah, so you can think of Kubernetes at the simplest level as just running a process, running a bunch of processes on a bunch of machines. And mm -hmm. for task, task as a project, like that distributed, for example, that I talked about, doesn't care that those machines are virtual machines or a bunch of Raspberry Pis on your dining room table or mm -hmm. you know whatever, doesn't care, right? Dask Kubernetes, Kubernetes is just one way to create that collection of machines and allow them to talk to each other. Great, okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And I, I should make the point clear too that other than that step where you're saying, you know, here's my cluster, connect to it, nothing else in your Dask code needs to change based on the fact that the cluster happens to be in Kubernetes versus somewhere else, which is, I think, a really nice feature. Ah, got it. OK, thank you. No problem. Any last questions? Oh, OK. If not, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, James, for presenting. Uh, it was a great presentation. I will upload the recording uh, and then I will send it as a comment on the Meetup page.